Some of you are a little worried about our pace at this moment. And uh, I, I want to remind you that I, I, I fully realize that this is not the most effective uh, teaching method, like just sit people in front, of a, in front of a fire hydrant and just open it and let it just go out all over them. That's, uh, I, I realize that at the same time, I, and the time I've spent with house churches overseas, uh, you've got people who are gathering together, uh, literally, at the risk of their lives and their families. And they're not as much concerned about learning style as they are, as give us as much information as you can, and we'll unpack it in the days to come. And so we want to get as much information as possible during the teaching times that we have allotted. And so that's why it is just saturated with information. That's why it even feels like sometimes we're going through it just too fast to process it. That's, that's really the kind of the goal. Remember, it goes back to this is not for our sake. It's for the sake of our brothers and sisters around the world. So with that said... Take your seat back in front of the fire hydrant, and we will turn it on. All right. He is Elohim, God. He is Yahweh. He is the Lord. Next, he is Adonai. Now, I mentioned this. This also means he is the Lord or Master. And the picture that you've got here is when you see it, capital L, lowercase o-r-d. And the picture is God having ownership, lordship over all things. really emphasizes his sovereignty, which we'll unpack in depth later on tonight. But Adonai emphasizes, well, two main things. Number one, Adonai emphasizes complete sovereignty in God. And I want to show you this. Turn with me to Isaiah chapter 6. This is another one of those instances where I want to show you the difference between why, why this is helpful when we're studying the Bible to know these different names of God. Look at Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1. And you got, I want to show it to you in your Bible, and you might be able to mark the difference between capital L, lowercase O-R-D, and then capital L, small caps O-R-D. And you look at verse 1, Isaiah says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. Capital L, lowercase O-R-D. That's not Yahweh, it's Adonai. And Adonai is more like, in a sense, it's more like a title for God. If you got Adonai and Yahweh, picture Yahweh as the name of God, Adonai more as a title for God, kind of like President George Bush. President's his title, George Bush is his name. That's kind of the picture you've got here, the differentiation between the two. And it's key. When you look at Isaiah 6, 1, and it says, In the year that King Uzziah died, King Uzziah had been a great king for most of his life, had followed the Lord, and the country had prospered. The people of Israel had prospered. But near the end of his life, he turned away from God. And, uh, and, the guy who, and then he died as a result of that, and the guy who took over after him was not doing a very good job. Confusion, anxiety running rampant among the people of God. They didn't know what to do, where to turn. And Isaiah says, in the year that King Uzziah died, I looked up and I saw the Lord. I saw the sovereign one. Isn't it good to know that when confusion and anxiety is rampant in our lives, we don't know what's going on around us. Isn't it good to be able to look up and see that the Lord is still on the throne, that he is alive and well. When kings die, he lives and he reigns. And he's not surprised by what happens. He has complete sovereignty over all things. That helps us understand Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1. Then you get down to verse 3. It says, holy, holy, holy is the Lord. That's Yahweh right there. But then you get down to verse 8, and the commissioning comes in. Then I heard the voice of the Lord, capital L, lowercase r-d, the voice of Adonai, the sovereign one, saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? So Adonai emphasizes complete sovereignty in God and second, complete submission in man. Complete submission in man. This is when Isaiah submits. When the Lord calls, you go. You've sacrificed the right to determine the direction of your lives. Those who worship Adonai, if he owns all things and he's sovereign over all things, that means those who worship Adonai are stewards. Or those who follow Adonai are stewards. I draw your attention there to Joshua chapter 5. When you look at this, Joshua is uh, right outside of pagan Jericho. He is about to deliver the, or lead the people of God into their first major battle in the promised land in Joshua chapter 5. You can imagine, he's very nervous. He's leading the people of God in this first major battle. And what happens is he's wandering by himself one night. He sees a strange man standing in front of him. And Joshua went up to him and asked, Are you for us or for our enemies? Neither, he replied. Don't miss this, but as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. Yahweh right there. As commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. Then Joshua fell face down on the ground in reverence and said, What message does my Lord Adonai right there have for his servant? And the picture is, don't miss this. You think about it. Put yourself in Joshua's shoes. You're the leader of the army of the people of God, about to go into this first battle. You meet this strange character. You say, Who are you for? And he looks at you and he says, I am commander of the army of the Lord. This is God revealing himself to Joshua through this picture. 
And Joshua realizes a very significant point in his life. He realizes he's not the leader of the army. God is the leader of this army. And he realizes as the leader of the people of God, he is still second in command. And this is, this is why he bows down and said, what message does Adonai have for me? I am a servant. Everything that I do, everything that I have, all my leadership has been entrusted to me by you, and I am second in command to you. This is a good reminder to every spiritual leader in this room. You are always second in command. To every man in this room who's leading your family, don't forget you are second in command. You are not Lord over your family. He is Lord over the family. And your job is to be on your knees asking, what message does my Lord have for his servant? This helps us to see this. Those who worship Adonai are stewards, and those who worship Adonai are servants. This is 2 Samuel chapter 7, when David says, you see the very end, you know your servant, O sovereign Lord. You have done this great thing and made it known to your servant. The picture is David is overwhelmed by the fact that he is a servant of Adonai. El Elyon means he is God most high. This emphasizes God's power. What happens is, this is in Genesis chapter 14, uh, Sodom and Gomorrah get into a battle, and they lose. And Lot, who is Abraham's nephew, is taken away in that. And so Abraham gets his pals together and said, let's go get Lot back. And so they go, and they, they win a battle, and they bring Lot back, and they bring all the, the goods and the people back from the, the defeat of Sodom and Gomorrah. What happens when he comes back, he meets two kings. One of them is Melchizedek, the king of Salem. He's a guy who confuses us really throughout Scripture. And then you've got the king of Sodom. And what happens is in this conversation with Melchizedek, Abram gives him a tenth of everything. That's a whole other story. But then the king of Sodom comes to Abram. And listen to what happens. Middle of the way through this passage you've got listed here. The king of Sodom said to Abram, Give me the people and keep the goods for yourself. So he said, keep the goods for yourself. All the goods, all the spoils of war, you can have those. And there's a lot of goods that he's talking about there. But Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have raised my hand to the Lord. Here it is, El Elyon, God most high, creator of heaven and earth, and have taken an oath that I will accept nothing belonging to you, not even a thread or the thong of a sandal, so that you will never be able to say, I made Abram rich. I will accept nothing but what my men have eaten and the share that belongs to the men who went with me. The picture is, Abram says to the king of Sodom, my God is most high, and he owns all things. And I'm not going to take one thing from you so that you would be able to say you gave this to me. God owns everything, and what I need, he will give to me. This is a con picture of confidence in El Elyon is the God most high. It's a picture of the fact that God alone is high and exalted. El Yon, that's what it literally means, high, uh, highest, uppermost. And you see this in Daniel chapter 4. This is a great, great verse. This is from the lips of a pagan king, Nebuchadnezzar. Listen to what this pagan king says. It says, I raised my eyes. I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes toward heaven. My sanity was restored. Then I praised the Most High. I honored and glorified him who lives forever. His dominion is an eternal dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the peoples of the earth are regarded as nothing. He does as he pleases with the powers of heaven and the Lord and the peoples of the earth. No one can hold back his hand or say to him, What have you done? You got a pagan king praising God as El Elyon, God Most High. He alone is high and exalted. And second, God alone is able to meet all of my needs. Ladies and gentlemen, if this God possesses all things, then we need nothing from this world. If this God possesses all things, then we need nothing from this world. They remember that God was their rock, that El Elyon, God Most High, was their Redeemer, Psalm 78. Next, El Shaddai. He is God Almighty, or the Lord Almighty. The picture here, it's used actually seven different times as El Shaddai in Scripture. And then a, n a number of other times is just Shaddai being mentioned. I think 30 different times in Job it's mentioned that way. This is Genesis chapter 17 when God is, is giving, him prom giving Abraham promises about how he's going to bless him and bring uh, a line through him that would be very fruitful. And the picture is, he's God Almighty, he is all-powerful, and not just all-powerful, but he is all-sufficient. Shaddai literally means Shah, the one who is, and die su sufficient. He is all-sufficient. May God Almighty grant you mercy so that you will, you will let your other brother and Benjamin come back to you. As, if for, as for me, if I am bereaved, I am bereaved. And in, in, a, in other words, he's saying, no matter what happens, God is sufficient. He will grant what we need. As El Shaddai, God is saying two things. Number one, he's saying, I guarantee my word. 
You look at Genesis chapter 28, verse 3, Genesis chapter 35, verse 11. This is God speaking to Jacob. And which, by the way, isn't that another great name for God? The God of Jacob. Isn't that a great picture? Jacob was not the most stellar dude that you've ever met before. He didn't have a lot to bring to the table. But God associated himself with him. I want to remind you, you're not the most stellar folks in the world. It's not about what you bring to the table. We are sinners in need of great grace. And God calls himself our God. So that's not even in the notes. We don't need to go there. Okay, I need to move on. I guarantee my word. He says, I guarantee my word as El Shaddai, and I guarantee my provision. I will provide for you. God Almighty appeared to me, Lord Almighty. And there he blessed me and said, I'm going to make you fruitful and will increase your numbers. He guarantees his provision. That leads to this next name, Yahweh or Jehovah Jireh, which means the Lord will provide. This is that beautiful picture we have in Genesis chapter 22 when God tells Abraham to take his only son Isaac, who he has provided for him and promised to him, and says, go and sacrifice your son on an altar. So he takes Abraham to after that hill and there is prepared to sacrifice him. And at that moment when he's about to, Abraham looked up and there in the thicket he saw a ram caught by its horn. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place the Lord will provide. And to this day it is said on the mountain of the Lord it will be provided. This word provide, it's a beautiful word. It literally means to see before. This word for gyra means to see. And in fact, just in the Latin, provide, pro, video, to see, video, before, pro. The picture is the God who sees everything beforehand. Now let that soak in. You, we will never have a need that was not already known in the mind of God. Isn't that good news? You find out you have cancer. Isn't it good to know that God saw that beforehand? You find out unexpected tragedy is hitting your life. Isn't it good to know that God sees before? When your husband or your wife or your mom or your dad doesn't come back, isn't it good to know the Lord will provide? The Lord sees before. He is Jehovah Jireh. Jehovah Sabaoth, the Lord of hosts. Hosts literally means armies or multitudes. Sometimes used to refer to angelic armies. Sometimes used to refer to earthly armies. This picture in 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 3. Just kind of keep this in mind. Year after year, this man talking about Elkanah went up from his town to worship and sacrifice to the Lord of hosts at Shiloh. Almighty there, the Lord of hosts. That's the uh, Jehovah Sabaoth. When you look at, uh, at the picture in Amos there, he who forms the mountains, creates the wind, and reveals his thoughts to man, he who turns dawn to darkness and treads the high places of the, Lord, of the earth, the Lord God Almighty is his name. I mention that one because Jehovah Sabaoth is used most often in the prophets. And you see him listed there, how many times it's used. And there's so much significance there because the prophets is oftentimes God speaking to his people when they were in the middle of exile, God speaking to his people when they were going through difficult times, dark times. Even when the Assyrians are attacking Israel, the Babylonians are taking down Judah, and their earthly armies are being destroyed, God is disciplining them, which, you know, this is in a sense not comforting that God is the Lord of armies because sometimes in the Old Testament He is taking pagan armies and He's using them to discipline His people. But the reality is why it's used all throughout the prophets is because He's reminding His people and He is the Lord of hosts. He is the Lord of armies and multitudes, and He has the power to deliver them. And they may be in exile, but God has the power to deliver them as they turn back to Him. He's the Lord of armies, the Lord of the multitudes, and God is the Lord who conquers any opposition. Now, I want to bring you back. First Samuel chapter 1, verse 3 is where we saw the Lord of hosts with Elkanah going to pray. This is where it's used again in that same chapter, First Samuel chapter 1. In bitterness of soul, Hannah. Remember the story of Hannah? Hannah wept much and prayed to the Lord. She made a vow saying, and this is where it is, O Jehovah, Jehovah Sabaoth, if you will only look upon your servant's misery and remember me and not forget your servant but give her a son, then I will give him to the Lord for all the days of his life and no razor will ever be used on his head. I just want to bring that to bear. This is uh, a bit of just a, um, I don't know, I wouldn't call it selfish picture, but the picture is, and we see this all over the beginning of the Bible. We see it with Abraham like we just talked about. We see it with Hannah here barren women who, who wrestle with God, the Lord of hosts here in First Samuel chapter 1, calling out for him to give them children. And I just, uh, as I was preparing this, we were celebrating Caleb's uh, two-year-old birthday and looking at my five-year-old son. And 
We have a God who conquers any opposition. And that doesn't just apply to armies that we face. It applies to any opposition we face. He is the Lord who of hosts. Jehovah Rophe. He is the Lord who heals. He is the Lord who heals. This is the picture in Exodus chapter 15 when God sweetens the bitter water and promises Israel that if they follow his laws, then he will protect them from the diseases that he brings on the Egyptians. He will, he will be the Lord who heals. Look at the very end of that verse. He said, I will not bring on you any of the de- diseases I brought on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. Now don't miss this. God didn't promise to heal here. Instead, he said, I'm the one who heals. He said, I'm the one who heals. Come to me, I'm the one who heals. I'm the Lord who heals, the Lord who restores, the Lord who cures. I'm the one who does these things. Praise the Lord, O my soul. Forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases. You say, there are people, there are people in this faith family, people in our lives represented around this room who have struggled with diseases, cancer, whatever it might be, and, and didn't experience healing. And so is he the Lord who heals? He is absolutely the Lord who heals. He is the Lord who heals for all of eternity. He is the Lord who heals ultimately. And even those who, whose body, when our bodies wither in this life, it's good to know we have a God who heals for all of eternity. He is Jehovah Rophe, the God who heals. Jehovah Nisi, the Lord is my banner. The Lord is my banner. Exodus chapter 17, it's a story when Amalek uh, stands, basically the Amalekites are in the people of God, in the way of the people of God, and Moses tells Joshua to go down and fight the Amalekites, and Moses stands on the mountain with the rod of God in his hand, and as long as he's lifting up the rod, this picture of a banner, then, then they're winning the, the, the battle, and Moses has people who are holding up his arms. That's the picture here in Exodus chapter 17. You get to the very end of that passage. Moses built an altar and called it, The Lord is my banner. He said, For hands were lifted up to the throne of the Lord. The Lord will be at war against the Amalekites from generation to generation. And the picture is, not just here in Exodus chapter 17, but the picture of a banner in that day really was kind of threefold. Number one, it's showing us that the Lord is our banner of identity. When you raise up a rod or a banner, this is, he's the one around whom we revolve. He's the one who unites us together. The Lord is our banner. Second, the Lord is our pole of gathering. Groups in that day, his armies would have flags that they would gather around. He is the one that we gather around. And third, the Lord is our flag of victory. I love this picture. You picture it. Now, this is where Old Testament stories just come to life. You picture your life. You're going through a battle in your life, and you get to the point where you're ready to raise the white flag, and you're ready to sur- surrender. You, you, you don't think like you th- think you can go on anymore to see that the Lord is our banner. The Lord is our uh, banner of identity, our pole of gathering, and he is our flag of victory. It's an incredible picture, and Isaiah used the same picture when he talked about the coming Messiah who would be the conqueror in Isaiah chapter 11. And that day, the root of Jesse, this is talking about, Jesus will stand as a banner for the peoples. He is Jehovah uh, Nisi, the Lord is my banner. Jehovah Mikadesh, the Lord who makes you holy. Now this is a, a term that we see used all throughout, especially Levit- Leviticus, but all throughout the Old Testament to talk about how God sanctifies things. He makes them holy. In fact, this root, which means to set apart for divine use, to sanctify for, for divine use, is used approximately 700 times in the Old Testament. This is why he says in Leviticus chapter 20, he says, I am the Lord who makes you holy. And this is beautiful because the reality is not one of us can be holy in this room on our own. We need the Lord to make us holy. He must be this God in order for any one of us to be holy. This is why he says in Leviticus chapter 11 verse 44, why it's quoted over in 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 15 and 16, be holy because I am holy and I am the Lord who makes you holy. This is where we go back to the contrast between the Old Testament temple and the New Testament, our bodies. In the Old Testament, items used in the temple were sanctified for use before God. In the New Testament, our lives are the temples that are sanctified for use before God. God's temple is sacred, 1 Corinthians 3 says, and you are that temple. You are the temple and the Lord who makes you holy. Jehovah Shalom, the Lord is peace. This is God when he comes to Gideon Form of an angel, tough time going on. Gideon has this conversation with the angel, realizes this angel represents God. Gideon gets a little scared. He says, ah, sovereign Lord, I have seen an angel face to face. But the Lord said to him, this is what the Lord responded to him, peace, do not be afraid. You are not going to die. 
So Gideon built an altar to the Lord, and there called it, The Lord is Peace. Judges chapter 6, verse 20 through 24. The picture is, God is our complete peace. The word shalom literally means complete, fullness, rest, which is what's in that next blank. God is our perfect rest. The picture is, in our times in our lives when we are disturbed, when things are anxious within us, it's the picture of, we've got in Philippians chapter 4, of the peace of God that transcends all understanding, that guards our hearts and guards our minds in Christ Jesus. He is our peace. He is our rest. In the middle of, it's the picture I have in Mark chapter 4, verse 35 through 41, this picture of the storms raging around the boat the disciples are in. And Jesus stands up, he lifts his hand, and he says, quiet, be still. And what you've got is a picture of peace amidst the raging tempest around. The Lord is our peace. Jehovah Sekidnu, the Lord our righteousness. Righteousness. And the picture here, to righteousness, is, it literally means to be, to be just or upright, means to be stiff to be straight, to be right. And he is our righteousness. You see it mentioned there in, in Jeremiah chapter 23 when he talks about raising up a righteous branch to David, a king who will reign wisely. This is talking about Jesus and do what is just and right in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will live in safety. And this is the name by which he will be called, the Lord our righteousness. God demonstrates his righteousness to his people. You see this in Leviticus chapter 22 when he's making them holy. The only way he can do that is because he is righteous. He is completely right. He's completely just. We'll talk about that a little bit later on. But the beauty of it is in Scripture, God not only demonstrates his righteousness, but second, God attributes his righteousness to his people. And this is the picture you've got there in 1 Corinthians 1.30 that Jesus is our righteousness God made him who had no sin to be sin for us in order that we might become the what? The righteousness of God. He is the one who, who is our righteousness. He is our right. Christ is our righteousness before God. How can you stand before this God? Only through Christ our righteousness. Jehovah Shema, the Lord is there. This is a great picture. When you read the whole book of Ezekiel, you see that there is, it's not always a positive picture in Ezekiel. There's a lot of difficult things going on all throughout the book of Ezekiel, but there's hope in the end. When you get to the end, it talks about a lot of Ezekiel revolves around the temple and how the glory of God had departed from the temple. But you get to the very end of the book and it says, the name of the city from that time on will be, the Lord is there. End of Ezekiel, the picture is, the Lord is there. And that we've talked about the name that dwells in the city or the name that dwells in the temple. The Lord is there. And so the picture is, now you've got to put this all together. Hope foretold in Ezekiel. Ezekiel is saying the presence of God will return to his temple. That's what Ezekiel was promising. And you look at, you might write this down, just Ezekiel chapter 37 in particular. In Ezekiel chapter 37, he talks about how he's going to put his presence, literally his spirit, in his people. That's what he says in Ezekiel 37. That's hope foretold. Hope experienced in the book of Acts, the presence of God, is here in our lives. It's the picture in Acts chapter 2, verse 1 through 4, when the Spirit comes down upon the people of God. The Lord is here, is the message of Acts 2 at Pentecost. The Lord is here with us. The Spirit is dwelling in us. It's f- uh, the, these tongues of fire, this picture resting on us. So you got his hope foretold in Ezekiel. He will be here. He will be with his people in his people. Then you've got hope experienced in Acts. The Spirit lives in us. And then you've got hope anticipated in Revelation. There's coming a day when the presence of God will be our light forever and ever. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 22, there at the end, we don't need the light of a lamp or the light of a sun because the Lord God in and of himself will be our light forever and ever. Next, Jehovah Rohi. Jehovah Rohi, which means the Lord is my shepherd. And here's where I want you to turn with me to Psalm chapter 23. Psalm chapter 23. And I, uh, I just want to share with you, this is a, a psalm that I'm guessing is uh, familiar to many of us. Some people say it's almost uh, over-familiar or overused. I just don't agree. I don't think you can overuse Psalm 23. And what I'd like to do is uh, not long after uh, my 
dad passed away unexpectedly, I spent some time in Psalm 23 and just uh, reflected on some things that are in this chapter. And I just want to share real briefly, I'm going to just run through these, but some reflections on this psalm that were particularly, um, well, impactful for me. I'll read it to you. The Psalm chapter 23, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. A few thoughts, reflections on Psalm 23. Number one, my shepherd's care is extremely personal. It's extremely personal. Do you see the personal pronouns all over Psalm 23? The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He restores my soul all throughout. Now there's an emphasis all throughout the Old Testament on the people of God, but this is an emphasis on each of us as individuals. I remind you tonight when we talk about this God, He is your shepherd. Not just the person beside you, in front of you, behind you. He is your shepherd. His care is extremely personal. Second, my shepherd never stops giving to me. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. Sometimes the Lord takes away. But the Lord never stops giving. He never stops giving. He's our shepherd. Third, my shepherd's provision is based on his grace, not my ability. Did you catch it? He makes me lie down. He leads me beside quiet riders. He restores my soul. He guides me. He's doing the action here. Isn't it good to know that when we walk through difficult times, it's not about our ability to get through those times. It's about his grace that sustains us through those times. He does it. He is our shepherd. My shepherd's provision is based on his grace, not my ability. Fourth, My shepherd's grace results in my shepherd's glory. He guides me in paths of righteousness. Why? For his name's sake. God has bound up his glory in providing for us as our shepherd. We walk through difficult times. He is making his glory known in the way he leads us as shepherd. Next, because my shepherd gives me everything, he leaves me nothing to fear. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. How can you have no fear? Because this shepherd, even in the face of death, is a conqueror. Even in the face of death, he's a conqueror. So you have nothing to fear. Because my shepherd gives me everything, he leaves me nothing to fear. Next, my shepherd not only sustains me, he satisfies me. I love this picture in verse 5. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You got that picture? You are surrounded by enemies. And the shepherd prepares a feast, a table before you. The presence of all that is evil surrounding you, all that is not good, all that hurts, he prepares a feast in front of you. Not only sustains us, he satisfies us. Next, my shepherd pursues me with his love. Get the language here. Surely goodness and love will follow me. He follows after me with his love. Follow me all the days of my life. Finally, my experience with this shepherd will never end. I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Ladies and gentlemen, you trust in this shepherd and he will never leave you or forsake you. There is coming a day, Revelation chapter 7, when we will serve him day and night in his temple. The sun will not beat upon us nor any scorching heat. Here's why. For the lamb at the center of the throne will be our shepherd and he will lead us to springs of living water and God will wipe away every tear from our eyes. Praise God, he is our shepherd. Okay, Jehovah Rohi is our shepherd. Now we're going to get into some of, the, some of the, the more titles for God, not as much proper nouns, proper names. We're going we're to go kind of fly through some of these. But Father, 
Picture in Psalm 89, 26. You're my father, my God, my rock, the rock, my savior. Now here's what's really interesting. You've got to catch this. There's a contrast here. You look in the Old Testament. Only 15 times in the Old Testament is, is God referred to directly as father. Only 15 times. One of them's there in Psalm 89. 15 times. That's the Old Testament. You get to the Gospels. You open up the New Testament. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Those four books. 15 times in the whole corpus of the Old Testament. These four books, over 100, and, uh, not over 100, exactly 165 times God is referred to as Father. 15 in the whole Old Testament, 165 times in the New Testament Gospels alone. And what's beautiful about it is all but one of those instances occur when Jesus is specifically teaching his disciples. So the picture is, this is a name that we call God. It's a name that is, that is a privilege for those of us who are followers of Christ to call him Father. The conclusion is, followers of Jesus have the unique privilege of calling God Father. I want you to think about this. And we're going to talk about these attributes of God. But just already, El Elyon, God Most High, God Almighty, El Shaddai, the one who heals, the one who restores, the one who is our banner, all of these these names that give us a picture of the greatness of God. And yet you and I, when we come before this God, do not have to bow our heads and, and say, oh God, ground of all being, and all that he is, which he is, and we should attribute all those things to him, but we have the privilege of bowing our heads before him and saying, Father, Dad, Abba, what an amazing truth to look to this God and call him Father. May we never tire, never take for granted the privilege we have to bow our heads and say, Father. This is the picture. When we call him Father, it really shows two things. Number one, we express our reverence to him. Matthew chapter 6, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. And this is so important to remember. When we pray, how we express our reverence to him as Father. When, when you think about a father figure, this is someone you revere, you are a child, he's the father. The picture is, really, a lot of times in our praying, in our prayer lives, we try to switch the roles, and we almost talk to God like he's the child and we're the father. God, this is what would be best for my life. This is what would be best for you to do in this particular situation, in this particular situation. We even have this idea that prayer is controlling God. The prayer is getting God to do what we want him to do. That's not the picture of prayer that Jesus is giving us when he says, pray to your Father. We express our reverence to him. We bow before him and say, you are Father. I am child. That means you know what is best for your children. We express our reverence to him. And second, we enjoy our relationship with him. It's reverence and relationship put together in one name for God as Father. Reverence and relationship. It's a picture of intimacy to call God Father presupposes we have a close, intimate relationship with God, like a son and a father, a daughter and a father. What an incredible picture. You have intimacy with the creator of the universe. You did not receive a spirit, of son, spirit, of, you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received the spirit of sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. And if we are children, we are heirs, heirs with God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we may share in his sufferings in order that one day we'll share in his glory. We are children, folks. We are heirs, heirs of glory that is waiting us. If we share in his sufferings, he said, the Bible says we will share in his glory. Continuing on, in these titles, he is king. This is all over scripture. 2,800 different times the term king is used, but not, often, not always to refer to God. But he is the great king above all gods. He is the king of kings, Revelation 17 says. He is our king. He is judge. We're going to talk later about the judgment of God, justice of God. Genesis 18 shows us this picture. Will, you not, will not the judge of all the earth do right? Isaiah 41, I love this. Uh, you go back and read it, but he's judging false gods. He's telling false gods, you, you, you set forth your arguments before me. I'm the judge of all false gods. Next, he is redeemer. To redeem is to rescue or deliver someone or something by paying a price. This is the beauty of Job 19. 
in the middle. This is one of the beautiful passages in Job when he's going through the suffering that he's experiencing. And he says, I know, I know that my Redeemer lives. In the end, I will stand upon the earth. And after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh I will see God. I myself will see him with my own eyes, I and not another. How my heart yearns within me. What a passage. I know that my Redeemer lives. He is potter. Oh, Lord, you are our Father. We are the clay. You are the potter. We are all the work of your hand. He is the light. He is not the light. He is light. 1 John 1, 5, God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. He is the rock. He is the rock. His works are perfect and all his ways are just. A faithful God who does no wrong. Just and upright is he. He is our fortress. We started with this in Psalm 50, 46. Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. He is our shield. He's our shield, Psalm chapter 3, and he is a consuming fire. This is the picture that you have in Exodus when God reveals himself on Mount Sinai. Come to Hebrews chapter 12. We come before him with reverence and awe because our God is a consuming fire. I, I know that that doesn't even begin to exhaust the names of God. We haven't. We, we didn't even get into the names of Jesus. That, that's got to be another secret church. I mean... Jesus is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the beginning and the end. He is the first and the last. He is the final Amen. Jesus is the bread of life. He is Christ, our Creator, our Deliverer, Everlasting Father. He is God. He is Good Shepherd. He is the Great Shepherd. He is the Great High Priest. He is the Holy One. He is the image of the invisible God. He is the Great I Am. He is the Judge of the living and the dead. He is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He is majestic and mighty, and no one compares to Him. He is the power of God. He is the resurrection and the life. He is the supreme sacrifice. He is the way, the truth, and the life. He is the very Word of God made flesh. Jesus is all of these things, and we cannot reduce Him to a poor, puny Savior who is just begging for you to accept Him. He is infinitely worthy of all glory in all the universe. And he does not need you to accept him. You and I desperately need him. We need him for every breath we breathe. The only way our heart is beating in this room tonight is because Jesus is giving it rhythm at this very moment. God, restore the glory of the name of Jesus Christ in your church today. His name is good. His name is great. His name is worthy. God, make us a people who have deep reverence, deep fear for the name of God. Okay, let's move on. Here we go. Attributes of God. Attributes of God. Now, what do you mean when you talk about attributes? Well, I want you to think about attributes in a variety of different ways. First of all, all of God's attributes are personal, meaning they describe who God is. They're personal. They describe who God is. We're not talking about what God does here. We'll get to that in a second, how that relates. We're talking about the essence of who God is, his essential nature. And what's key is, I just want to say this to the side. This isn't in your notes, but we need to realize when we talk about different attributes of God, I think we're going to look at 14 different attributes of God. And I'm not even saying that these are the only 14 attributes, but they're the ones we're going to talk about. But I don't want you to picture this as 14 different pieces to the pie. We have this tendency to think about God as his love over here and his mercy over here and his justice over here. That's not true. God is, in his very essence, he is love. Not just part of God is love. All of God is love. All of God is mercy. All of God is justice. All of God is wrath. All of God is omnipotence. These are not just different pieces to a pie you put together. They are all. The, the beauty of the attributes of God is found in their unity. It's in 1 John. In the beginning, just like we saw a second ago, it says God is light. In the end of 1 John, it says God is love. And sometimes we have this tendency to think, well, at this point in history, God was Love, but in this point in history, God was wrath. Old Testament, we see God as wrath. New Testament, we see God as love. That's not true. It's not true. God is always love and always wrath and always mercy and always grace and all that he is. And the beauty is how they all come together. That's what we're going to see. They describe who he is. It's not a collection of attributes that are just added together. 
They are the whole of who he is. All of, attri- all of God's attributes are not just personal. They are practical. What I mean by that is they help us understand how he acts. Now, we see his attributes at different points, revealed in different ways. There's no question that it, at times we see the justice of God very clearly. But it doesn't mean that he's just at that point and wasn't at another point. Doesn't ever, we can't ever say, you can't ever say that God was more loving at this point in history than this point in history. Or more loving at this time than this time. You can't say that because, well, number one, he's all love. And if you're all, then you can't be more at any point. That was kind of deep for 815. But anyway, you, you, got, you got what I'm saying there. And the second reason you can't say God is more loving at this point than he was at this point is because of this next thing. Because all of God's attributes are perfect. To say that he's more loving at another point than, than this particular point over here implies that he wasn't perfectly loving all the time, and he is. Your heavenly Father is perfect. All of his attributes are perfect. He is perfectly loving, perfectly gracious, perfectly just. They're personal, they describe who he is. They're practical, they, desc- they, they help us understand how he acts, and they're perfect. All of God's attributes are excellent, perfect, complete in every way. All of, that, all of God's attributes are permanent. He doesn't gain attributes. He doesn't lose attributes. He is holy. He was holy. He has always been holy. He always will be holy. He has always been loving. He is loving. He will always be loving. His attributes are permanent, intrinsic, unchangeable qualities, which we'll talk about more. All of God's attributes are praiseworthy. We praise Him for His love. We praise Him for His wrath. We praise Him for His justice. We praise Him for His mercy. All of these things. Now, this is so key, and we're going to camp out here for just a minute, but we've got to be on the same page here on these two truths when we think about the attributes of God. Truth number one, God's glory is His supreme passion. God's glory is His supreme passion. Isaiah 43, He says, I've created you for my glory. A few chapters later, when he's talking about what he's doing among his people, he says, I, I do this for my own sake. For my own sake I do this. How can I let myself be defamed? I will not yield my glory to another. We could go from cover to cover in Scripture and show from Genesis to Revelation, God is orchestrating all of history to put his glory on display. God's supreme passion is his glory. Now, we don't think like this. We think If I were to ask you the question, why does God love you? We would think, well, because I'm lovable. That's that's not what Scripture teaches. Say, what do you mean? God loves you for His glory. God loves you for His glory. Why did you just die on a cross? Well, for my sins. Pay the price for my sins. Well, yes, in part, no question. But not ultimately. What did Jesus say in John 12 as he was preparing to go to the cross? He said, Father, glorify your name. Romans chapter 3, verse 21 through 26. He did this to demonstrate his justice, to demonstrate the character of God. He went to the cross. He went there for his glory. God lives. God works to exalt himself. God is a radically God-centered God. Now that, that's a little later. That's thick. God is it's radically God-centered. You say, well, what do you mean? That, that almost sounds kind of selfish, that God lives to exalt himself. Well, let's ask a follow-up question. Who else would you have him exalt? At the very moment God exalts anyone or anything else, he is no longer what? God. God alone has the right to exalt himself. And all throughout Scripture, he is showing that right. His supreme passion is his glory. We don't, we don't think like this. We don't grow up in, in Sunday school riding on our pictures that we draw. We write, God loves me. We don't write, God loves himself and, and <laughs> send that home. But the picture is, God is exalting himself. Now you say, well what, well, what does this mean for us then? The beauty of it is, God's glory is his supreme passion. Second truth, God's glory is our supreme satisfaction. Think about it this way. If God is perfectly, infinitely loving, and all that is love is summed up in God, then what is the greatest way he could show love to you or me by giving us what? 
himself. Enjoyment in himself. Glory in himself. Knowledge of himself. This is our supreme satisfaction, knowing his glory. The beauty of it is our satisfaction is found in fulfilling the purpose of God, glorifying his name. This is where they come together. And this is so key. When we're going to talk about these attributes, we need to realize that this is, this is the picture here. Because when we think about God's love and God's wisdom, maybe, we think about things that happen in our lives. When things, tragedy hits, and hurtful things happen in our lives. And we begin to point the finger at the love of God. You don't love. You're not wise. Look at what you let happen. And we start questioning the attributes of God because our our happy world has been turned upside down. The picture is God is not revolving this universe around our happy world. Now this is difficult. It's thick. And we're going to talk about God and evil later on. But the picture we have in Scripture is the ultimate end of all things is the glory of God. And the beauty of it is that involves the satisfaction of His people. And that, when we understand this, we will see God's love truly. And we will see God's love in all of its beauty and an incomprehensible beauty. So just hold on to that. It's very important. This is why the psalmist can say, one thing I ask of the Lord, this one thing I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to seek Him in His temple. He knows His satisfaction is found in seeing the glory of God. Psalm 84, how lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord Almighty. My soul yearns, even faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart, my flesh cry out for the living God. Even the sparrow has found a home and the swallow a nest for herself where she may have her young. A place near your altar, O Lord Almighty, my King and my God. Blessed are those who dwell in your house. They are ever praising you. This is the beauty. This is not, don't read Psalm 84 and think, this means I need to be excited about going to church. Just stop going to church. So did he just say stop going to church? Yes, you are the church. It's not Old Testament religion. We don't have to go to a place to encounter the glory of God. You and I have the privilege of experiencing the satisfaction of God's glory on a daily basis. So let our souls yearn, even faint, to experience His glory moment by moment, day by day. And yes, go, gather together with other believers and give Him the glory that He is due. But experience His glory as your supreme satisfaction on a daily basis and spurn everything in this world that would keep you from experiencing His glory. This is a way to live a God-centered life. And this is the way to supreme satisfaction. Okay, here we go. Moving on. Attributes of God. His greatness and His goodness. That's how we're going to split them up. Some people split up the attributes of God into different things. Communicable attributes and incommunicable attributes, which means communicable attributes are attributes that He shares with us. Incommunicable attributes are attributes that He doesn't share with us. I'm going to take greatness and goodness and kind of use those as two categories, seven in each. Tozer said, the essence of idolatry is the entertainment of thoughts about God that are unworthy of him. That's a strong statement. Are our thoughts unworthy of him? That is idolatry, he says. Greatness of God is independence, his spirituality, his eternity, his omnipotence, his omnipresence, his omniscience, and his immutability. Let's start with independence. When we talk about the independence of God, we're talking about how God is both self-existent and self-sufficient. Self-existent and self-sufficient. We'll take those one by one. First, the self-existence of God. Does God exist? That's a, a valid question for our topic of discussion tonight. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. Psalm 14, verse 1 says it. I want to I be very careful here because uh, the nature of the way... That, that this night is structured is, um, is all throughout saying things, saying truths, what I believe the scriptures teach. At the same time, we're not taking time to unpack all of these things in depth. And it almost can seem like we're just callously running through these things. And, oh, there's a simple answer to God and evil. Okay, we can address that. That's not what I want to communicate. But I do want to give us some foundations to stand on. And I just want to say that because we're, we're basically addressing here atheism and the idea that there is no God. We need to realize, I just want to kind of give that caveat before we go into this. We need to realize that to say there is no God is a virtually unprovable statement. People say, well, the, the, proof, the burden of proof is on the, the theists, those who believe in God, to prove that God exists. On the contrary, the proof, burden of proof lies on the atheist. To say there is no God, to say that something is not there, someone or something is not there, 
That means you have to have searched out all possibilities that it might be there. If I'm going to say someone is not in this room, then I've got to search this entire room to see if that person is here. In order to say God is not there, that means you have to have searched all knowledge to see if God is there. And if you've searched all knowledge, then that means you have all knowledge. By definition, that makes you God. And therefore, you deny your own divinity with your statement that there is no God. It doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't add up. It's, it's, it's an absolute negation, and, it, and it, doesn't, it doesn't hold water. You can't say there is no God. So you've got to at least admit there's a willingness. That you've got to at least admit that there's a possibility that God exists. And so we go from that and, okay, we go from that and we, we, we say, oh, how do we know God exists? And I believe Scripture shows us that God has revealed himself to us very clearly. And I want you to think about it just in three ways. Again, this is like tackling the existence of God in two minutes. That's what I mean when I, I kind of gave that caveat. And I'm not saying it's this easy. Oh, yeah, well, I can answer that in two minutes and we can move on. But some foundations. Number one, look at creation. Genesis 1-1, obviously. It's, it's important to ask, where does the universe come from? Astrophysical evidence, obviously. Scientists point us to this Big Bang theory that however many thousands or millions or billions, however you uh, look at that, however many years ago that there was a Big Bang that caused the universe to come into existence. The ultimate question is not what happened at that point. The ultimate question is what caused it to happen. Ex nihilo, nihilo fit is a phrase that means out of nothing, nothing comes. So if I've got in my hand nothing, then what can you get from that? You get nothing. Out of nothing, nothing comes. And you think about this in a threefold progression. Whatever begins to exist has a cause. That makes sense? If something begins to exist, and something has to cause it to exist. Whatever begins to exist has to cause. The universe began to exist. Therefore, the universe has a what? Has a cause. What the Big Bang requires is that the universe began to exist and was created out of nothing. This makes it very awkward for the atheist or evolutionist who believes that the universe came into existence out of nothing. How did it begin to exist without a cause? Out of nothing, nothing comes. I think it was Aristotle who said nothing is what rocks dream about. The picture is out of nothing, nothing comes. So you've got to believe, either you've got to have faith that it just came out of nothing with no cause, or you've got to have faith that there was a cause behind it. And this is where we come to uh, intelligent design, which we'll talk about in a second. But, but I love this quote. It's one of my favorite quotes. from It's a guy named Robert Zastro, one-time director of NASA's, uh, NASA's Institute for Space Studies. He says, uh, the details differ, but the essential elements in the astronomical and biblical accounts of Genesis are the same. This is an exceedingly strange development, unexpected by all but the theologians. They have always believed the word of the Bible, but we scientists did not expect to find evidence for an abrupt beginning because we have had, until recently, such extraordinary success in tracing the chain of cause and effect backward in time. At this moment, it seems as though science will never be able to raise the curtain on the mystery of creation. For the scientist who has lived by his faith in the power of reason, the story ends like a bad dream. He has scaled the mountains of ignorance. He is about to conquer the highest peak. And as he pulls himself over the final rock, he is greeted by a band of theologians who have been sitting there for centuries. <laughs> Isn't that great? Look at creation. Second, related to that, look at design. Look at design. And by this, I mean God leaves God leaves the imprints of his glory upon the design of the earth. He says in Romans 1, since what may be known about God has planted them because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power, and his divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that men are without excuse. In other words, God has revealed his glory through creation. It's Psalm chapter 19, first part of Psalm 19. Creation reveals the glory of God. And you look, you look, even at scientific pictures, and you look at the fact that if the earth was, was just slightly closer to the sun, we would all burn up instantly. If it was just slightly farther away from the sun, that we would freeze over. This is the picture. If you got, sometimes it's been described, it's, uh, it's kind of the picture, illustration of the watchmaker, that the intricacies of creation point to a designer behind them. You don't take, say you take a watch and take all the pieces of the watch apart, put it in a bag, and just shake it up. Will it come out like this? No, you've got to have someone who will design it. And this is the picture. And I, I praise God for, for many people, very, very sharp, very smart people, very intellectual people, philosophers, philosophers, philosophers scientists, it's getting late, who, uh, who are, are working very hard when it comes to intelligent design. 
And there's actually a whole new movie out called Expelled, talking about how these intelligent design theorists have been ostracized in the scientific community. But there's a lot of strong discussion going on. And what's really interesting is, just not so you're not misled, intelligent design is not just supported by Christians. Intelligent design as a theory and science is supported by non-Christians, even by people who don't believe in God, but at least are willing to admit there had to be a cause when this thing started. There had to be a designer behind the whole deal. One time agnostic Paul Davies said, through my scientific work, I have come to believe more and more strongly that the physical universe is put together with an ingenuity so astonishing that I cannot accept it merely as a brute fact. Look at creation, look at design, and look at morality. Look at morality. What I mean by that is the existence of objective moral values points to a moral creator. Romans 2 talks about how all of us have a moral law written on our hearts. We all know right and wrong. We have an awareness of right and wrong. We have an awareness when we do wrong or when we do right. And this comes from a moral law giver. If evolution is true, if there is no God, then by what basis do we have a moral law? It's not there. We're just product of evolutionary processes, and there's no such thing as right and wrong. There's no basis for a moral law giver. Nietzsche knew this when he declared God is dead in the 20th century, and he said the 20th century as a result of that will be stripped of meaning and value and morality in life. He said it would be the bloodiest century we've ever seen, and you see that even reflected. He knew. He knew as an atheist who said there is no God that that radically affects the moral foundations of a culture because that strips a culture of the moral law giver. Michael Ruse, an agnostic, an agnostic philosopher of science, shows this. He's right. He says the position of the modern evolutionist is the morality is a biological adaptation, no less than our hands and feet and teeth. Considered as a rationally justifiable set of claims about an objective something, ethics is illusory. In other words, it has no foundation. I appreciate that when somebody says, love thy neighbor as thyself, they think they are referring above and beyond themselves to some law of love, something that says this is love. Nevertheless, such reference is truly without foundation. Morality is just an aid to survival and reproduction, and any deeper meaning is illusory. I'm not saying that if you're an atheist that you can't live a moral life or believe that there's morals. The question is, where does that moral, moral morality come from? Where does that moral law come from? The question is, if God does not exist, then do objective moral values exist? It undercuts the whole picture. The fact that we have morality written on our hearts points us to the existence of God. So, look at creation, design, morality. Where did God come from? This is the question that every four-year-old child asks their mom or dad. So what do you say? I mean, really, I'd like to know. I'm about two years away from this. What, 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 What do you say? Here's what I would encourage you to say. Say God was never created and never came into being. That'll solve it. That'll be easy. They'll walk away from that. Just be like, yeah, of course, of course. They may look back at you and they say, what do you mean by that? And say, I don't know. I just heard it late one night and I wrote it down. Uh... From everlasting to everlasting, you are God. The reality is God has no origin. He has no origin. He is the uncaused one. This is certainly a picture of faith. We talked about the universe begins to exist. Therefore, it has to have a cause. We're trusting there's one who is uncaused. We're trusting it takes a lot more faith to believe that the universe is uncaused than it does to believe that God is uncaused. God was never created and never came into being. And God is entirely independent. Acts 17.25 says he's not served by human hands. He doesn't derive his life from any external source. All of us derive our lives from external sources. God doesn't. God, that means God doesn't, do, that God doesn't need us or anyone that matter for anything. He doesn't need anyone for anything, including us. And that leads to the self-sufficiency of God. God has no needs. This is one of my favorite verses in Psalms. Psalm 50, verse 10. For every animal of the forest is mine, and the cattle on a thousand hills. I know every bird in the mountains, and the creatures of the field are mine. So he says, if I were hungry, I would not tell you. For the world is mine and all that is in it. Isn't that great? God says to his people, just in case you need to know, if I were hungry, you would not be the person I would come to. (laughs) He has no needs. God does not need our companionship. Ladies and gentlemen, God did not create man because he was lonely. Sometimes we got that thought that God created us because he was lonely. God had perfect relationship and fellowship within himself in the Trinity. We'll talk about that later. He doesn't need our companionship. He doesn't need our worship. God doesn't need our songs. He doesn't need our Bible study. He doesn't need our church attendance. He doesn't need your worship. At this moment, he is surrounded by innumerable creatures who are singing his praises and doing his bidding at every single moment. He doesn't need our worship. 
Tozer said, were all human beings suddenly to become blind. Still the sun would shine by day and the stars by night, for these owe nothing to the millions who benefit from their light. So were every man on earth to become an atheist, it could not affect God in any way. He is what he is in himself without regard to any other. To believe in him adds nothing to his perfections. To doubt him takes nothing away. He doesn't need our companionship. He doesn't need our worship. He doesn't need our discipleship. We talk about making disciples all the time here at Brook Hills. He doesn't need us. He doesn't need us to do that. Bill Bright, he is probably one of a few men, a handful of men, who have had more effect on the cause of Christ in the world in the 20th century than anyone else. And he passed away. He said this soon before he did pass away. He said, who is Bill Bright? I'm a little nobody among six billion nobodies. God has given me several things I think he's wanted me to do. And yet there doesn't seem to be any assurance time will allow me to finish some of these. He doesn't need Bill Bright any more than he needs a twig on a tree. He created us in his image, and he loves us, and he esteems us. And we are of worth to him, but he can raise up sticks and stones to worship him. So it's not as though my departure is going to leave a big hole. He doesn't need our discipleship. The question is, does this make us meaningless? If God doesn't need us, where's our meaning? And we find our meaning in life oftentimes in in being needed. I'm needed by my kids. I'm needed by my wife. I'm needed as a a pastor in this role. Find our life. If we are not needed by God, then that make our life meaningless. Our meaning in life, though, is not found in God's need for us. Our meaning in life is found in our need for God. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the exact opposite of self-esteem doctrine that dominates pop psychology in our culture today. That says meaning is found in you finding significance. That's not what Scripture teaches. What Scripture teaches search for significant is that God is infinitely significant and our significance is found in embracing His infinite significance. Our meaning is found in embracing Christ as the one who is infinitely significant. And the beauty of it is, this is why He must be the center of our lives. The beauty of it is, when you think about His love, this is ultimate love. God is not compelled by some need to love us. There's not a need in him that compels him to love us. God chooses to love us with a totally, completely unselfish love. This next blank we'll skip, come back to in just a second. The truth is, God needs no one, yet he works through anyone. And this is the beauty here. God exists for himself. We exist for God. You've got a quote here from Tozer. And... I hesitate to even share this because it's something I am ashamed of, but it gives you a little context. I remember when I read this quote, I remember I was sitting in an unreached village in Asia. We were hiking into these villages and taking the gospel, uh, basically smuggling materials, gospel materials into people's villages who never heard the name of Christ, hiking in and out, and tough places to get to, hard work. And I remember the thought crossed my mind. I began to think uh, that that God must be glad to have me on his team. And I read these words. Almighty God, just because he is almighty, needs no support. The picture of a nervous, ingratiating God fawning over men to win their favor is not a pleasant one. Yet if we look at the popular conception of God, that is precisely what we see. 20th century Christianity has put God on charity. So lofty is our opinion of ourselves that we find it quite easy, not to say enjoyable, to believe that we are necessary to God. Probably the hardest thought of all for our natural egotism to entertain is that God does not need our help. We commonly represent him as a busy, eager, somewhat frustrated father, hurrying about, seeking help to carry out his benevolent plan to bring peace and salvation to the world. Too many missionary appeals are based upon this fancied frustration of Almighty God. An effective speaker can easily excite pity in his hearers, not only for the heathen, but for the God who has tried so hard and so long to save them and has failed for want of support. I fear that thousands of younger persons enter Christian service from no higher motive than to help deliver God from the embarrassing situation his love has gotten him into and his limited abilities seem unable to get him out of. Add to this a certain degree of commendable idealism and a fair amount of compassion for the underprivileged, and you have the true drive behind much Christian activity today. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to remind you of something. Your life, my life, your church, this church, 
church at Brook Hills and every single church in this room could drop dead and turn to dust, and God will still make a great name for himself among the nations. He does not involve us in this mission because he needs us. He involves us in this mission because he loves us. This is a privilege. It's a privilege to be a part of declaring the glory of God to the nations. And it's a privilege we cannot forsake. And we needn't think that we are necessary for it. God will get his plan done. He will get his plan done in India. He will get his plan done in Pakistan. He will give his plan done in Afghanistan. In fact, I want us to pause now. And before we take our next break, I want us to contemplate what God is doing in these countries. And I want us to contemplate the greatness of God, all the characteristics of God that we are seeing in light of the need in Afghanistan, in India, and in Pakistan. And I want us to consider, I want us to ask very honestly the question, how is each of our lives going to impact people in these nations for the glory of this God?